Okay, so hello and welcome back to another Unity tutorial. In today's video, I'm going to be showing you guys what I've been up to in my own game that I've been working on. So I'm working on a multiplayer game using Mirror. Obviously, alongside this, I'm actually making some tutorials about Mirror for those of you who want to make multiplayer games. So yeah, I'll be showing you around the project I've been working on, showing you the code, how I've set things up, and I hope you guys learn something from this. And obviously, feel free to ask me down below for any specific things you want videos on, so I can make a video showing you about how the lobby system works, how players, you know, get sent to the other scene, and then how they get set up with input and everything, and the camera. So yeah, let's jump into it. So I guess the place to start is the menu. So when you start, well, first of all, actually, we've got the network manager wit, which actually does quite a bit of stuff. Um, let's, let's start in there. So this stores the minimum amount of players, because by default, the network manager stores the max number of players, but I also need a min before the game can start. And then a reference to the menu scene, it's actually a string, but because they've used the scene attribute that they've added, I think, themselves in Mirror. Um, it's in Mirror, yeah. Uh, the scene attribute actually allows you to drag in a scene instead of a string, and it just reads it as a string. So if you actually go back over to Unity, you see down here for the menu scene, I've actually dragged in uh, the actual scene reference. And then what it's done is it's, it's got the name off that. So it's actually good. It, it stops you having to type in the scene name manually and getting it wrong. And then it has uh, two different player prefabs. So it has one for the room and one for the game. Now, even the one in the game, it's not the player that you control. It's just simply a, I, can, I guess, representation of you. Because for example, let's say we destroy the player's object when they die. If we destroy this, then we get problems or the player disconnects or there's different things that can happen. So I need an object that just kind of exists and stores, for example, the player's score and other things and their name. So I have the room player. The room player um, actually handles some UI. I'm probably going to change this, to be honest. I don't quite like how this works, but uh, when I first started, this was, you know, the first like solution that came to my mind, and it works. Because right now, when I spawn in the player, if we go to uh, resources, the room player, the room player actually has the lobby UI as a child uh, here, okay? So this uh, lobby UI is a child of the room player, and what it says is, it says, when we uh, start on, on authority, so basically when our um, player starts on this computer, then tell the server what my name is and set the UI active. So that means that for every player, there's some UI. Even though it's disabled, it's still there, and it doesn't really make sense to be. So I'm going to shuffle this around a bit to have it have the UI separated, but it works. Because right now we can uh, set the display name, and when the display name changes, uh, everyone updates it over here. So it goes over all the text mesh pros. So there's four of them. Uh, where are they? These four, like waiting for players, gets changed to be the player's display name. And then there's actually text next to that for saying, you know, is ready or not ready. And then it basically sets it to be green if they're ready, or red and then not ready. Okay. So that updates every time this function update display gets called. An update display gets called whenever um, someone changes their ready status or their display name. Now, ideally, when they update their ready status, I only update the ready text, and when they update their display name, I only update their name. Uh, right now, I update both every time. It's not ideal. It's still it's absolutely fine. It doesn't cause any problems. But you know, for the sake of efficiency and just cleaner code, I should probably separate that out. And then uh, here are some commands. So remember, commands are called from a client to the server. So as a client, I say command set display name and tell it what I want to be called. And the server doesn't really need to do any validation because um, actually this is where you'd put validation for whether their names, you know, maybe inappropriate or whatever you'd check. You know, does it follow those guidelines? You know, maybe you don't allow swear words or something like that. Or maybe the name's not too uh, not long enough or something. You'd do that here. But for now, I don't care. Whatever the player says they want to be called, I set them to be called that. And because this is a sync var, what actually happens is it syncs it with all clients, and all clients call this function when it gets updated for them. So when a, another client is told that your name's been updated, it then updates display for them. Okay. So when I when I uh, change ready status or so it's like that again here. When I ready up, if if is ready, then is not ready. So it basically toggles right. If I press ready, it goes on, off, on, off, and then. Um, Whenever that changes, keep in mind this is on the server, this is a command, commands only run on the server. I then, in my game manager, or sorry, my network manager, I then check, okay, go over every player and see if they are ready to start. Because is ready to start will say, okay, well, we're not ready to start if we've got not got enough players. 
We're also not ready to start if any player is not ready. But if we've got enough players and everyone is ready, then return true. And then handle ready to start. Basically, we'll um, toggle the start game button for the leader. If, well, if you're the leader, then it toggles it for you. Okay. And then at the end of the day, when they press uh, start game, it then says start game. Now, this is where I should actually validate, uh, you know, validate is lobby owner. Because right now, technically, anyone could call this command. Um, and we just say, okay, we'll trust them to start the game. Now, you know, when it comes to cheaters and video games, you don't really care about those cheaters that join your lobbies and start games for you. You know, it's a bit dumb. It's never going to happen. I mean, then again, it probably will happen. But um, just because people like to, you know, prove that they can do stuff. So I'm going to validate here at some point that the lobby owner is the person that is starting the game. Because um, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if someone managed to hack and make the start game button interactable, so long as when they press it, it, you know, stops on the server. So it's like, no, you can't start the game. Okay, that was a lot. Let's move on to the next part. Okay, so the player menu, we have the input field for the name and a button to confirm. I'm not going to go through the actual saving of the name, but what happens is when you do confirm, we save the name, we then turn off the name input panel and we turn on the landing page panel. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to go hide this for now. And on here, we've got three buttons. So host calls main menu .host lobby, which I'll show in a minute. Join calls, um, actually, yeah, well, so when you join, you don't immediately join. You have to say, you know, what lobby do you want to join? So I have this other thing called enter IP address, uh, where you put in your IP address. And when you're done, there is a button. The button calls join lobby menu dot join lobby. Uh, let's look at the host one first. So let's, you know, I've turned on so many different panels. I'm just going to turn that off, turn this off and go back to here for the main menu. So the main menu quite simply just calls the network manager and says start a host and then disables itself because then it goes from there. Um, the actual lobby UI is on the player, so we don't need to activate it because it gets activated itself, though that will probably change. As I said, I'm going to change around how that UI works. Um, so it's really easy to start hosting. You just call dot start host. And then if we actually go to the enter IP address, the join lobby menu, uh, I actually have some events in the network manager for certain things happening, like the client connecting and the client disconnecting. And the thing is, if the client disconnects while they're trying to join a lobby, what it actually means is, it usually means that they've uh, failed to join because that, that could be because uh, there's no, no one hosting with that IP, for example, or the game's full, or there might be different reasons why you get disconnected when you're trying to connect. So I say, when that happens, reactivate the join button. I don't want them to be able to spam it, so I turn it off when they try and join. When they try and join, I turn off the button, but as soon as they fail to join, then I reactivate it so they can try again. Um, obviously, I could have some text pop up here saying like, hey, that IP address is incorrect or something went wrong or whatever. And then finally, when someone actually does connect, so, so sorry, when you connect to the server successfully, okay, on client connected, then uh, we re-enable the button in case, you know, later on you go back to the menu and it's still disabled. Now, that should never happen, but I thought it's still a good idea to do that. Um, and then we disable ourselves, so we get rid of the lobby UI. And we also disable the landing page panel, which is the same as over in the main menu script. So if I look over here, just like how we dis uh, disable the landing page panel, we do that here too, because all we need after this is the lobby UI, which is on the player. And that leaves us with the lobby UI. So the lobby UI is currently in the room player. As I said, you know, we set the name text and the ready text and the start game button. It's all that stuff. Um, the only other difference is we also have the game player, which is the same, but has less stuff. Uh, it adds itself to a list when it starts existing and removes itself when it stops existing, um, as well as don't destroy and load because this is the version of the player in the actual game. So as I go between levels, I don't want to get rid of this object. I want it to keep existing. It's going to store, as I said, the name and the score and everything. Whereas the room player, uh, I don't want to exist between scenes because it should be destroyed as soon as, um, as, soon as we leave the menu, we get rid of this. I actually have some code in the network manager um, that's, so we store room players and we store game players. And what should happen is when we actually uh, disconnect, we remove ourselves from the game players. And then down here somewhere, when we go to the game, I loop over all room players. And then I actually um, spawn in the game player prefab and destroy the room player connection. And then what happens is when they get instantiated, 
they start existing and then they add themselves to that list. So every player actually knows who else is who who else are the other game players, as well as the room players if they need to. And then we can also add later on maybe spectate players or like you know, other players that can join our game but aren't actually playing the game and they get treated differently, they have different objects representing them, they have different logic being run, they don't store maybe display name or, or score, maybe display name they do but not score. Um, and one thing I do is, because they set their name in the room player, they need their name in the game player. So I actually, somewhere here, I set the game player's display name to be the room player's display name so that actually gets uh, transferred across. So if I end up displaying their name in the game, it's still the same as the name they chose um, back in the lobby. One thing to note is when you spawn things in on the network and on other clients, you need to have them registered. So the way you do that typically is if you go to the network manager, there is a list here of spawnable, re uh, registered spawnable prefabs. The problem is if you have a game with lots of things being spawned in, like if you're making Pong, for example, you just need the ball and the, the paddles. That's, that's all you need. But if you're making a game with lots of things, like in my game, I'm going to be spawning in players, maybe different player characters, different projectiles, different attacks, whatever. There's a lot of things to spawn in, and it'll be a pain to manually add stuff to this list, remove it, and, you know, make sure everything's in there and not forget things. So when I used to use Photon, the way you did it in Photon to register things is you put them all in a, in a resources folder, and they all got loaded from that resources folder. So I've actually written some code to do that. I've got resources folder. And then inside that, I've got spawnable prefabs where I have the player, uh, actual game object, you know, the physical player in the scene, as well as the room player and the game player. And then I also have some other systems that need to be spawned in by the server. The server needs to spawn in the round system and the player spawn system because they are network identities. They exist. Now, I originally had it on server only because I'm thinking, you know, the round system, the server should be the one that owns it and handles it. But... The problem is that then won't give any client callbacks and the actual clients need callbacks from these things to know when to, for example, start doing the countdown UI and all these other things that they need to do. So then the player spawn system, if I go over here, what it does is it, um, over here, when the server, when this starts on the server, right? So only on the server, we listen to, um, on server readied. So on server readied is not what it seems. It's not when the server's ready. It's actually when a uh, client is ready and it's called on the server. So all the events in um, Mirror, they, the on server and on client is where they're called. So they're called on the server when someone is readied. We spawn their player. So to spawn their player, we just effectively say spawn a game object for the or spawn the player prefab uh, at a certain place, and then spawn it on the server the player instance but then we have to actually well we don't have to but we are giving it um authority to the connection so whoever uh this this on server readied will tell us who readied up with a network connection and by passing that in as a second parameter it gives them authority over the object so the server has to spawn in your player object for you but then it can pass over authority to you so that it's like you can then move it and you know do all the commands and everything from it it's your object so that's how that works and then it also stores the next index so that when the next player joins and wants to get spawned, they don't spawn in the same place. They spawn at a different place because we've got an array of, or sorry, a list of spawn points. And then um, the spawn points themselves can't really exist um, in the editor. If I actually show you, if I go to the scene and spawn points, I've got these different spawn points. I've given them some... Uh, rendering here on the gizmos just so I can easily see them. What they do is on awake they add themselves well as a spawn point and when they get removed they destroy themselves as a spawn point. Okay and all that does is it adds it to a list which is static and removes it from a list and then when it gets added it's then ordered. So what happens is all these four game objects that have player spawn points on when they start existing they add themselves to that list and when they stop they remove them. The reason I can't just have them referenced uh, normally is these spawn points exist in the map, whereas the round system or the player spawn system does not exist in the map. It doesn't, it is just spawned in as a prefab, so it needs a way to actually get these things. And obviously I've only shown you it with two players connecting. It actually, it goes to spawn point zero here, then it goes to spawn point one, and then, oh, that's three. So we go spawn point two and spawn point three. And these little green lines show you uh, the actual direction in which you're going to face when you spawn, okay? So I can I can modify these whenever I like. 
and I don't have to go back and change anything anywhere else. I just have to move where this point is and then save it. And then now this player spawns over here. Okay. Okay. So for the final script, we're going to be covering the round system. So the round system, when it starts existing on the server, cares about also when someone's ready on the server and then unsubscribes when they, uh, when this gets destroyed, it then checks every time this happens that, um, the number of players that are ready, if it doesn't equal the number of players that there are, then return. So only once everyone is ready, uh, do we then enable our animator? So that would then uh, do this. So round system, animation, it then goes three, two, one. Okay, then as soon as it gets to here where it starts saying begin, it then calls this method start round. Start round is a server callback, so it only gets called on the server. Then it tells all the clients, hey, remove this from your input manager. Now input manager is something I've written. Um, it just stores uh, different action maps that should be enabled and disabled. I'll quickly scroll through it, but I'm not going to explain how it works. Um, something I came up with, if you guys you know want to know about this, then uh, it's just some way that I've uh, figured out. I mean, maybe there's a better way, but I couldn't find anything online for enabling and disabling certain input maps. So you see over here, uh, sorry, action maps. I've got the player action map, which is for move, look, jump, attack, so on, whatever else I had here. Then developer is like a different layer. The developer is not the same as the player. So when I disable the player, I can still use my uh, console command like input basically. Um, because this is uh, done by string, uh, the only way I can seem to find it is by string. Because uh, this is called player, I then here say action map names dot player, which is a constant I made so I don't misspell it anywhere. I say basically remove player. And that means that um, in that dictionary up here, when I add and remove to it, it checks how many is left of that particular thing. So if there is one or more, then you can't use that input. But if there is zero, then you can. So when we spawn the player in on the spawn system, we actually add a player. So that means disable all player input, but then I actually override and say, except from look, enable looking. Okay. So when you spawn, you can look around, but you can't do anything else. And then the round system says, okay, um, when the round starts, then remove player, which effectively unlocks all of their input so they can all move. Okay. Um, and I think that's it actually. Yeah. So also actually when the animation finishes, there's one more event over here when it's completely done, which is countdown ended. And you'll see on countdown ended, we just disable the animator so that it's not just left on and still doing stuff. When it's disabled, it's then not wasting resources. And yeah, that's it. Um, there's obviously more code in the project than this, but this is pretty much what I've got done so far. It's the main stuff and it's how the game works to the point where you can, as I said, go to the menu, host a game, join the lobby, ready up. When you're both readied up, the host can start the game. When you go to the game, you spawn in and you can't move. Then there goes three, two, one. Then you can move. That entire thing, that is what I've shown in this video, uh, quite briefly. Um, but yeah, if you guys want more videos like this, feel free to let me know down below. If you guys want me to cover anything that I've shown in this video in more detail and make an actual separate tutorial for it, then feel free, you know, let me know down below and I'll definitely make videos on that kind of stuff. Uh, ask any questions about mirror, multiplayer, whatever, you know, join our Discord server, you can ask there as well. Uh, but yeah, if you like the video, please leave a like and subscribe. I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching and goodbye. But of course, before I go, I've got to thank my patrons. A special thanks to Jason Swearingen, Liz Kimber, Josh Folsom, Bearded Eye, Dustin Miller, Francisco Diaz, Rack, Yoris Letta, Heidi Zorko, Rene, Budaray, and Remy Baldwin. If anyone else is able to help support the channel monetarily, link to my Patreon is down below. If not, there are also links down below to other social media, such as Twitch, Twitter, and Discord, as well as our website. If you could help us out by checking out any of those, following any of those, that'd be greatly appreciated. I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching, and goodbye.